You're asked to think of the spacious garden of a country rectory, adjacent to a park of many acres, and separated therefrom by a belt of trees of some age which we knew as the plantation. It is about thirty or forty yards broad. A close gate of split oak leads to it from the path encircling the garden, and when you enter it from that side you put your hand through a square hole cut in it and lift the hook to pass along to the iron gate which admits the park from the plantation. It has further to be added that from some windows of the rectory, which stands on a somewhat lower level than the plantation, parts of the path lead in there too, and the oak gate itself can be seen. Some of the trees, scotch firs and others, which form a backing in the surrounding, are of considerable size. There is nothing that diffuses a mysterious gloom or imparts a sinister flavour. Nothing of melancholy or funereal associations. The place is well clad, and there are secret nooks and retreats among the bushes. There is neither offensive bleakness nor oppressive darkness. It is, indeed, a matter for some surprise when one thinks it over, that any cause for misgivings of a nervous sort have attached itself to so normal and cheerful a spot. The more so, since neither our childish mind when we lived there, nor the more inquisitive years that came later, ever nosed out any legend or reminiscence of old or recent unhappy things. Yet to me they came, even to me, leading an exceptionally happy, wholesome existence, and guarded, well not strictly, but as carefully as in any way necessary, from uncanny fancies and fear. Not that such guardian avails to close up all gates. I should be puzzled to fix the date at which any sort of misgiving about the plantation gate first visited me. Possibly it was in the years just before I went to school, possibly on one later summer afternoon of which I have a faint memory, when I was coming back after solitary roaming in the park, or, as I bethink me, from tea at the hall. Anyhow, alone, and fell in with one of the villagers, also homeward bound, just as I was about to turn off the road onto the track leading to the plantation. We broke off our talk with good nights, and when I looked back at him after a minute or so, I was just a little surprised to see him standing still and looking after me. But no remark passed, and on I went. By the time I was within the iron gate and outside the park, dusk had undoubtedly come on. There was no lack of yet of light, and I could not account to myself for the questions which certainly did arise as to the presence of anyone else among the trees. Questions which I could not very certainly say no, nor, I was glad to feel, yes. Because if there were anyone, they could not well have any business there. Be sure it is difficult, anything like a grove, to be quite certain that nobody is making a screen out of a tree trunk and keeping it between you and him as he moves round it and you walk on. All I can say is that if such a one was there, he was no neighbour or acquaintance of mine, and there was some indication about him of being cloaked or hooded. I think I may have moved at a rather quicker pace than before, and have been particular about shutting the gate. I think, too, that after that evening, something of what Hamlet calls a gain-giving may have been present in my mind when I thought of the plantation. I do seem to remember looking out of a window which gave in that direction, and questioning whether there was or was not any appearance of a moving form among the trees. If I did, perhaps I did, into suspicion to the nurse, the only answer to it will be being the idea of such a thing and an injunction to make haste and get into my bed. Whether it was on that night, or a later one, that I seemed to see myself again in the small hours, gazing out of the window across moonlit grass, and hoping I was mistaken in fancying any movement in that half-hidden corner of the garden, I cannot now be sure. But it was certainly within a short while I began to be visited by dreams which I would much rather not have had, which, in fact... I came to dread acutely, and the point round which they sended was the plantation gate. As years go on, it but seldom happens that the dream is disturbing. Awkward it may be is when, while I am drying myself after a bath, I open the bedroom door and step onto a populous railway platform, and have to invent rapid and flimsy excuses. But such a vision is not alarming, though it may make one despair of ever holding up one's head again. But in the times of which I am thinking, it did happen. Not often, but oftener than I liked. The moment a dream set in, I knew that it was going to turn out ill, and there was nothing I could do to keep it on cheerful lines. Alice the gardener might be wholesomely employed with rake and spades as I watched at the window. 
as the familiar figures might pass and repass on harmless errands. I was not deceived. I could see that the time was coming when the gardener and the rest would be gathering up their properties and setting off on paths that led homeward or into some safe outer world, and the garden would be left to itself, shall we say, or to denizens who did not desire quite ordinary company, or only waiting for the word all clear to slip into their posts of vantage. Now, too, was the moment near when the surroundings began to take on a threatening look that the sunlight lost power, and a quality of light replaced it which, though I did not know it at the time, my memory years after told me was the lifeless pallor of an eclipse. The effect of all this was to intensify the foreboding that began to possess me, and to make me look anxiously about, dreading that in some quarter my fear would take a visible shape. I had not much doubt which way to look. Surely behind those bushes... Among those trees there was motion, yes, and surely, and more quickly than seemed possible, there was motion, not now among the trees, but on the very path towards the house. I was still at the window, and before I could adjust myself to the new fear there came the impression of a tread on the stairs and a hand on the door. That was as far as the dream got at first, and for me it was far enough. I had no notion what had been the next development, more than it was bound to be horrifying. That is enough in all conscience about the beginning of my dreams. A beginning it was only, for something like it came again and again. How often I can't tell, for often enough to give me an acute distaste for being left alone in that region of the garden. I came to fancy that I could see in the behaviour of the village people whose work took them that way an anxiety to be past a certain point and moreover a welcoming of company as they approached that corner of the park. But on this it will not do to lay over much stress, for, as I have said, I can never glean any kind of story bound up with the place. However, the strong probability there had been one once, I cannot deny. I must not, by the way, give the impression that the whole of the plantation was haunted ground. There were trees there most admirably devised for climbing and reading in. There was a wall along the top of which you could walk for many hundred yards and reach a frequented road, passing farmyard and familiar houses. And once in the park, which had its own delights of wood and water, you were well out of range of anything suspicious, or, if that is too much to say, of anything that suggested the plantation gate. But I'm reminded, as I look on these pages, that so far we've had only preamble, and there's very little in the way of actual instant to come, that the criticism attributed to the devil when he sheared the sow is like to be justified. What, after all, was the outcome of the dreams to which without saying a word about them as liable during a good space of time? Well, it presents itself to me thus. One afternoon, the day being neither overcast nor threatening, I was at my window in the upper floor of the house. All the family were out. From some obscure shelf in a disused room I had worried out a book, not very recondite, it was, in fact, a bound volume of a magazine in which were contained parts of a novel. I now know what novel it was, but I did not then, and a sentence struck and arrested me. Someone was walking at dusk up a solitary lane by an old mansion in Ireland, and being a man of imagination, he was suddenly forcibly impressed by what he calls the aerial image of the old house, with its peculiar, malign, scared and skulking aspect, peering out of the shade of its neglected old trees. The words were quite enough to set my own fancy on a bleak track. Inevitably I looked, and looked with apprehension to the plantation gate. As was but right, it was shut, and nobody was on the path that led to it or from it. As I said a while ago, there was in it a square hole giving access to the fastening. And through that hole I could see and it struck like a blow on the diaphragm, something white, or partly white. Now this I could not bear, with an access of something like courage, only it was more like desperation, like determining that I must know the worst. I did steal down, and quite uselessly, of course, taking cover behind bushes as I went, I made progress until I was within range of the gate in the hall. Things were, alas, worse than I had feared. Through that hole, a face was looking my way. It was not monstrous, not pale, fleshless, spectral. 
Malevolent, I thought, and think it was. At any rate, the eyes were large and open and fixed. It was pink, and I thought hot, and just above the eyes the board for a white linen drapery hung down from the brows. There is something horrifying in the sight of a face looking at one out of a frame as this did, more particularly if its gaze is unmistakably fixed upon you. Nor does it make the matter any better if the expression gives no clue as to what is to come next. I said just now that I took this faith to be malevolent, and so I did, not in regard of any positive dislike or fierceness which it expressed. It was, indeed, quite without emotion. I was only conscious that I could see the whites of the eyes all round the pupil, and that, we know, has a glamour of madness about it. The immovable face was enough for me. I fled, but at thought what I thought must be a safe distance inside my own precincts, I could not but halt and look back. There was no white thing framed in the hole of the gate, but there was a draped form shambling away among the trees. Do not press me with questions as to how I bore myself when it became necessary to face my family again. That I was upset by something I had seen must have been pretty clear. I am very sure that I fought off all attempts to describe it. Why I make a lame effort to do it now I cannot very well explain. It undoubtedly has had some formidable power of clinging through many years to my imagination. I feel that even now I should be circumspect in passing that plantation gate and every now and again the query haunts me. Are there here and there sequestered places which some curious creature still frequent, whom once on a time anybody could see and speak to as they went about their daily occasions, whereas now only at rare intervals in a series of years does one cross their paths and become aware of them? And perhaps that is just as well of the peace of mind of simple people. And that was the last ghost story Montague Rhodes James ever wrote. It was actually published five months after his death. And I'm not the first one to say this, but it's possible that it's not just a story, that this really happened. Maybe that's why he wrote so many ghost stories. He was thinking of this a lot. Who knows? This was written in 1936. So we can't know what happened then. I hope you enjoyed this, and maybe not the spookiest and scariest of things, but hope you enjoyed it, and happy Halloween. <laughs>